find it. Let's show browser. Where is it? Okay. So you will see my full screen now. Yes. So I hope you can see it. So I will start with the uh, this queued up stuff. I hope you can see it. So if you're going to play with the deep learning, usually you want to use your graphical board, which is uh, usually NVIDIA, which is very useful because there are libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch and others that could utilize these graphical boards. And they become a lot cheaper now due to the gaming industry and so on. But they are very difficult to get <laughs> nowadays because a lot of people want to buy them. And uh, I sold my Sears Old for almost the same price as I bought it for <laughs> last week. Anyhow, so this is one alternative. So if you are running on a Windows machine, so you can either uh, install CUDA and tools and so on to run on that machine. And I installed uh, something we call WSL2 this morning. This is so you can run Linux on the, on the Windows machine. So you start Linux as a command shell and then you can give a lot of Linux commands. And the reason for wanting to use Linux is that many of those libraries in, in Python and so on doesn't work under ordinary Windows. Many do, but if you want to utilize some smart stuff, then it might not work in Windows. So that's one reason to have Linux. I also tried dual boot Linux. That means when you start your computer, you can decide whether you should run Linux or Windows. And then, uh, yeah, then it often works, but all of a sudden it stopped working. So then you don't get this question in the beginning. So you can only start Windows and then you may be lost all your stuff you did in this Linux part. So that is not so safe either. So here is anyhow instructions of how to install this WSL and it takes some hours to do and you need to go into Windows Insider program and then you can install an NVIDIA preview driver and then after that you install WSL2. So these are some steps to do. But if we have the Linux machine, we don't have to do these steps. Exactly, yeah. So if you already have Linux, you should be happy. <laughs> oh. Unless you want to run uh, Photoshop then. <laughs> <laughs> then I don't know if you're missing anything when you're running Linux. Do you feel you are, there are something lacking per se? No. Uh, hello, Kali. Hey. I, I think your volume is quite low. Um, I don't know. Yeah. We, I couldn't hear you clearly. Okay. So I can see if I can. Uh, Increase the level. Is this better? Yeah, much better. Yeah, much better now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I had some problems previously with that. So happy that you said. Anyhow, so these are some of the solutions to, to run uh, Linux related stuff. But these are quite complicated and you also need a NVIDIA board. And they are difficult to find today and also of course expensive and if you have a laptop you need to buy a special laptop containing these nvidia boards so that is also very expensive and they are not so powerful either because they are like restricted nvidia graphical boards on those laptops and they easily overheat also so they kind of slow down to keep the temperature low so one of the reasons for that is then to use Coolab. And that is, oh, 
I give up this. I, I will switch to English. So, starts in your favorite language. So here, when you start Colab, you can uh, see your recent, what you did. Untitled my traffic sign. I'm working with the traffic sign lab right now. So I hope to give some hints of how to do it. And then you can have your documents in your Google Drive, if you have a Google, or in GitHub. So then you can, like my GitHub is Nutte2, for instance. For those who know Swedish, this is my name when I was young. <laughs> and this is from Snuttefilt. Anyhow, uh, so here you have your GitHub repository where you can store your examples because when you finish your uh, collaboratory, everything is kind of lost. So you need to save, so on. And then of course you can use upload and select a file from your computer to upload this Jupyter notebook. But yeah, and then we have of course some examples, overview of features and so on. So maybe we can open one of these. So here you can see how it works. So if you haven't tried the uh, Jupyter Notebooks before, then you can see that there is code cells and there are like text cells. And uh, you run this by playing this play button or control enter, and then it runs and then it will say then. And now you see it's connecting, initializing, and then connected, and then it runs 10. And then you can change the code like this and rerun a cell. So it's very practical because you can rerun now and then, go back and forth and so on. So it's very useful. And uh, yeah, so here is some ideas of how you can do things. And uh, if, if we need some special library to install, can we do this? Absolutely. So if I make a new notebook, so you can call a, a, via exclamation mark. You can, for instance, use peep, install, a, say maybe install torch, something. So if you run this, Uh, this torch will be installed. And uh, it's already installed, this library. So if you need some other library, you can install that as well. And of course, you need to be uh, aware of the combination of versions so they fit together and so on. So it's like a Linux machine. So we call this a container. So you can get this and run your stuff. And here you have the files in your machine and it starts with some sample data, some training data for some examples and so on. And uh, you can store your own files here also as well, but they are only temporary. So when you leave this, the code you store here will disappear. And here you can see how much uh, yeah, you can see, maybe you can see a bigger screen. Oh, that was not so very useful. Uh, so let's see if we can make them bigger, as you can see. So here you can see we have like 100 gigabyte disk and uh, 12 gig RAM. So it's quite, quite okay for being free. <laughs> And then you can upload your files. For instance, if you try this uh, traffic signs and so on in many different ways. So either you can, uh, I can open some notebook. Someone mentioned, uh, see if I have them in my GitHub maybe. I all forgot this. If you go for traffic sign, a classifier, which you can find yourself 
my googling. So then we have this urlib request version where you can retrieve this from this website. So if I run this, you get this question. This was not authorized by Google. So particularly this notebook can destroy something on your machine or something. So please be careful. So here you see this really request fetch those traffic signs. And this is much quicker than to uh, download to your own computer and then upload to this Coolab directory. So this is, is quicker and I think it's already ready. So it didn't take many seconds. So that's nice. Do, do you know the limits for the Colab uh, storage? Like, for example, if you want to download maybe 200 gig of data. Yeah. yeah, you have the storages. Now I have used 38 gigabytes here. Oh, okay, okay, so it's 64. Yeah, so I have like 100 gigabytes to go. So we used 38 with this traffic sign data. And... Uh, we have still 68 to go. And you can see here, you have this traffic sign zip file. So then you can unzip this file by import this zip file and unzipping extract all to this directory. Then we can see it takes some time be before it updates. Now. So now we have this uh, train file, for instance, and then we have a training file and we can load this file and so on. So Carla, you're not using uh, Google Drive. So this, uh, this data set is temporary, right? It will be lost yeah. next time you log in. Yeah, exactly. So you have to fetch it. So, but it seems to run for just a few seconds. So it's not a big problem to for myself, for instance, I have a, a not so much memory left. Like in my, for instance, this required 38 gigabytes and I only have 17 on my Google Drive. I have to pay for getting this extra space. I don't know if you pay for your Google Drive, but the university have Google apps, but they're going to remove that. So I'm not sure if it's still there, but it's, it's possible. So here is how you can, uh, if you press this, how you can use Google Drive. So there, here's an example, how you can fetch data. So you just press this one and then select this example. And then you can see how you authenticate yourself, so to say, so to get this uh, notebook to access your Google Drive. So you have some file ID and so on, and then you can have your content. And that could be practical for at least for smaller data or result files or whatever, if you want to store the results in running. And here is also some other stuff. Suppose you want to catch a real camera. Here's some code examples how you can get, I haven't tried it myself, but if you have a web camera, you can fetch the pictures from that one. And you can also, which is quite new for Coolab, you can add forms so we can run this example. You can see that. So here we can, my, so you have, can have values here. So if you run something with different parameters and so on, so you can change those before you run. And it always forgot this ah, show in English and you have to leave. Okay, so you can uh, rerun your code without changing in the in the text, you can have some easy to use. Suppose you make a Coolab script for some kind of customer or non-computer person, then they can select things 
in this kind of menu. There is also a menu system where, which you can download and install where you have traditional menus. But this is maybe good enough and this is very easy and included. So you can see those things, some extra features, how to do in this little menu selection. And here you have your files. And now because I left, you know, I lost my uploaded data. So now I have to go back to my other Coolab session. And then uh, here I have the data. So I can run my files and here do things. Uh, another thing in Python is this pickle, which is a way to store just about any structures in a file, which can be streamed by this pickle module. So you can use this and import things. And this NumPy and Pandas is typical things which you often use in Python when you're dealing with this. Yeah, at machine learning or just data analysis and so on. And then to show images, you usually use plot, which is a little bit special in Coolab. So you usually write in the beginning here, they haven't wrote write those things. But if you have a new thing, you need to tell it to display these images in line. Uh, yeah, here it is, matplotlib in line. So you import matplotlib pplot as plt, and then you need to write this to make it show, show these pictures. So here you want to show the small images of traffic signs and so on. It can be very useful to see if the data looks okay, if they're upside down or strange colors or if they are black and white and so on. And then you can use a lot of analysis. You can maybe plot some training classes examples here to see that you have a reasonable, reasonable number of examples of all these traffic signs. So some of them are very few and some of them you have very many. I don't know what's happening with my mouse. It's jumping around by itself. Anyhow, so this is how you can play with the, uh, this. Jupyter Notebooks in Coolab for free. And then it's not completely free and it's not forever. So there is a time limit. We have the resources limit. And uh, as I mentioned, there is, you're using half your disk space for this. So of course, if you run a more complicated problem, you will run out of disk. And then you can, uh, uh, see if we find this, okay. But you can uh, buy an extra space and powerful things, but it's not available in Sweden, at least nowadays. So my mouse is jumping around. Uh, so we can see the settings. And here we select the GPU. So the standard setting is none but you can select the graphical processing units, unit, and you can also select the TPU, which is Google's tensor processing unit. And uh, that might be a good idea, but sometimes things doesn't work with the TPU, which is supposed to work with the GPU. So I seldom use the TPU. It's a little bit more powerful, but it's easy to run into trouble. And uh, there is also a possibility to add a script that once in a while goes into the menu to keep this session alive for many hours. I think Songwa has put that in Canvas. So you can install this little script and then go for some sleep or something. And then this runs for many hours instead of, it was one hour. I think it's shorter now, maybe just half an hour or something. I think it, 
gives up early. So it, you can change runtime. It's usually more common to have this setting. So here is how much memory, how long can you run? Maximum 12 hours, but it will disconnect when idle for too long. So, and this idle is maybe just 10, 15 minutes. So you have to be making something at the computer to stay, make it stay alive. I have a question quickly. Yeah. Uh, does that mean that you can run like uh, a GPU training session for up to 12 hours if you keep uh, keeping it alive? Or is there like an additional, uh, a separate limit for the GPU time? For uh, the GPU or, or I don't know, it's the collab is limited to 12 hours in total, even if you try to keep it alive. But I didn't understand the question. So yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, does the 12 hours also look like, for example, if you're training a model now using GPU, does that mean yeah. you can train it for 12 hours? Yeah. If you, okay. You can train it for 12 hours if you doesn't left it idle. So you need to either install the script or mm. press some buttons yourself now and then. Like when you run something for a long time, you go there and maybe at least move the mouse. I don't know if it detects a just a mouse move, but if you seem to be in that, yeah, it maybe it works differently in different browsers and so on. But usually if I just go for a Fika break and then I come back, then it shut down. So maybe it's because it's idle like this. We don't do anything like here. We haven't done anything. So maybe this will shut down. And then you can restart, but then it lost the data and so on. So you have to upload it again. Yeah. So you can, uh, you're connected to a GPU runtime, but not utilize, utilizing the GPU. So you can change to a standard runtime. So it keeps track. If you don't use the GPU, but you have allocated a GPU runtime, you'll get this warning and you can change to a standard. So they try to keep the resources, save the resources for other people who really use those things. You can also choose TPUs, right? Yeah, it's either uh, either GPU or TPU, yeah. Or Have you noticed any difference in performance between these two? Yeah, GPU, TPU is sometimes a little bit faster. Okay. And, but it's also when you allocate a GPU like this, you can get a little bit dif different GPUs. Okay. So this is, now it's Google Compute Engine backend. Sometimes it's written what kind of GPU you get, if you get a T4 or if you get a P100 or something. Yeah. But, um, but they I seem to finish okay. this reporting. So now I don't know <laughs> which one it is. Maybe I can read it in, with some code or so. Okay. So what I found out, if you change the runtime environment, then existing session gets resetted. Yeah. Uh, so you have exactly. to read so, yeah, Exactly. So if I change runtime now to none and save, then, uh, yeah. So it's connecting, initializing, connected. And now the data is lost. So it restarts a new. So that is bad. Yeah. Maybe if you have a lot of information you, and then you change it. So, and one common problem is that you forgot to change this. So if you run this for some times and then, oh, and then you start to doing some deep learning stuff, which runs slowly. Oh, I forgot this change runtime time. And now you change this to GPU and then you have to rerun from start again because it loses everything. Uh, I think you should keep your data set on Google Drive. At least you won't have to uh, download it every time. Yeah, but I think this download, I don't know if it's fast because it's still, if it's directly connected, but if I run this, you can uh, take time, one, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 seconds. 
So it's not so long, it's seven seconds. Okay, where, where did you get the zip file? Uh, it's not content, right? Oh no, it, it's in the, yeah. This zip file is on uh, Amazon uh, AVS. It's in S3 bucket. Yeah. So uh, uh, S3 buckets, which you can fetch this. Mm -hmm. But you can fetch it from your original data as well. So I can, uh, if I open, for instance, uh, in my GitHub, I have this one, and I restart everything. So you can also use this vjet command. And that is a get file on the web, from a website. The zip files where uh, your lab has the link. You see now, I will hide this panel. So if you go here, and we go for the assignment. And we look for this German site, this one. And we have the data files. Data set selection, uh, downloads. Uh, this link. So if I go for this uh, final test images, for instance, then I can copy link address like here, and then I can write a new cell. V get equals, and then I select paste, or oh, how did I do this, paste, control V, like this. And then where to store this in, in data too, instance. So, so this site has some, uh, you can see it in the bottom line, in this is some mirrored uh, provider in Denmark, for instance, maybe it's closer to us. So then you can fetch this data from, from Denmark. And now I run into this problem, which is common. You have this session and that session at the same time. And then you need to manage sessions. There you go. You have too many sessions. So this one is untitled 21, but you can terminate the other ones. So not allowed to have too many sessions. And now you can run this again. So this is how you can get the files from this directly from oh, what happened now. I mean, my personal experience with the assignments so far, I had a lot of trouble that um, I thought automatically disconnected. So I started implementing it on the local computer. And it runs yeah. pretty fast. Yeah, it, it should be possible to run on a local computer as well, particularly if you have an NVIDIA board. But I don't know why this minus P, why this... So I'm, I'm using normal CPU, but I don't have two device. So. You have extra yeah. equal sign. Uh, extra equals, yeah. Yeah, the... exactly. That's right. So, so now it works. I was just curious how... So this is not as fast as the previous one. The previous one took three seconds, or seven seconds. But this VJet takes 10 seconds. And this is only the test images. The training is even bigger. So, so the other solution with the uh, requests are better. If I open this, this one. So this from S3 request is better. And then you also get those traffic signs in a better format as a zip file, where you have, when it's easier to plot it and handle it and so on. Because this from the original site is using PPM, which is a universal format, but the red, green, and blue are in the wrong order and so on. You have to 
convert all those pictures if you want to plot them and so on. So Carla, I think you should share this uh, zip file link uh, in Canvas. Yep. Absolutely, yep. I wrote notice here, zip file link. I don't know if I should share this, the whole file as well. I just Google it. So I guess you can Google it, Google it it's, uh, yourself. So, but I, I will show that and then you can run this. One problem with this is that it is using a uh, TensorFlow and it also is using an old version of an old version of TensorFlow as well. So this doesn't work directly. And we want to use PyTorch because we have this disturbance code and so on. And then you need to be in PyTorch as I understand for the analysis of how disturbances can destroy the classification. So this was a little bit about Colab and there are some edit commands and so on. Uh, and usually you run one at a time, but you can also run all. So just press run all and then you can go do some other stuff for some time. And you can change run times. And we have some settings as well. You can uh, change some fonts. And this is the Kula Pro, which is not available in Sweden, but in these countries. So maybe it will be in Sweden someday. And then there is like the kitty mode I don't know if you can see anything, but it will be a kitty running <laughs> on the screen. I don't know why. Uh, maybe you need to run. So there will be a, ah, <laughs> to terminate those things. Allocating, connecting. So keep track of this connecting, initializing, and now you see this little kitty. <laughs> so this is some kind of sign that's still alive and running. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you can change to a dog if you prefer dogs instead. Uh, so, so this is about this uh, Coolab, I think it's very nice from Google to provide this and we have used it a lot on courses. You don't have to install anything. You have powerful, powerful GPUs and so on. And you can actually run quite complicated problems in this Coolab. And maybe you should try as Songwa says to, to connect with your, with your uh, Google Drive if you have space enough for that. For myself, I don't. I'm just happy if I have one gigabyte left. So you can see that maybe if you run, uh, I don't know where you can see somewhere, the remaining space. Yeah, I don't know. So anyhow, so the total on a standard Gmail account or Google Drive account is 17 gigs and this require already uh, 38. So the traffic sign won't work in a traditional Google account. So, so we move on to PyTorch. So to install PyTorch, you can run locally, but as I mentioned, PyTorch is already installed in Coolab, so you can use it there directly without any install. But here you can create your commands. So if you're going to install Windows with PEEP and use Python and have a certain CUDA version, then you just copy and paste this command to your command window in Windows and then run this code. And it's a little bit difficult here because you have to be careful what CUDA version you use. So if you install the NVIDIA drivers, it's important to select 10.2 or 11.1 because otherwise Torch won't work. I made a mistake and installed the latest CUDA, which is 11.2 and it didn't work. And I don't know how to 
uninstall CUDA and how to install an old CUDA. So you have to go through the menus at NVIDIA to find like historical installed things. So be careful so you don't don't install 11.2 because it won't work and then you have a lot of work. So you must keep track of the correct versions. And if you run Conda, there's some special treatments as well. So usually it's good to not run the newest because then you may run into problems. Even if PyTorch works, there might be other libraries that doesn't work yet. So a good idea might be to stay on a little bit lower, particularly if you don't have the worst <laughs> or the best graphical board, which usually the new ones, they utilize some new functions in new boards. But if you don't have them, it's asking for trouble to installing with a new version. So here is some instructions how to do this. <clears throat> And we had some discussion, me and Song, about PyTorch contra TensorFlow. <coughs> PyTorch is a little bit more difficult to learn. <coughs> Sorry. But it's uh, becoming more, more and more popular. So many people have struggled with TensorFlow when they want to make something special. And uh, then they move to PyTorch, and then everything is much more easy. So. If you go for the tutorials, so we can look at the basics <clears throat> and they are also possible to run in uh, Coolab. So you can run through this. I will just go through it very quickly. So you have this import torch and this is a little bit strange because you think you maybe import PyTorch, but you, the name is torch saving you some printing time <laughs> maybe and uh, then uh, some extra stuff and this pie plot and here is some data and we have this data sets which is this one and data loader and so on and uh, here we can fetch data directly from the s3 sites built in into pytorch so we can run this in Coolab. So we remember here now to change how oh, we change language first, English. And then we change the runtime. And we select GPU to save some time. And then we run this. Okay, I have to kill this one. And then we run uh, run this allocating connecting initializing and now we can run so we have still some data okay and then we use this import statements not much to do now i have the kitten mode to make us happy <laughs> And then uh, we download the data. So it's very quick. And here we create an iterator, which is a data loader. So here we can use this iterator to loop through these things. And we have this batch size, which means for, for training or testing we have 64 at a time so we save some time to to be able to run run it quicker so we here you can see here that the data is 64 the batch size one color channel 28 times 28 pixels and the shape is a torch a tensor of size 64 and it's integers so here we can see, and one problem which we don't need to handle in TensorFlow is we need to copy the files and so on, or the data to a, a device. So if, we, if there is a CUDA, an NVIDIA device, 
then uh, we can uh, copy to that. So we see how it works. So, so if we run this, we see there is a CUDA device because we selected it in the runtime and it's using CUDA device and we have this network. So here is how we create a network. We inherit from NN module, this thing we imported here, NN, the library, the torch library, neural net. And we create this module, we call it any name, neural network in our case. And we have an init function, which is called when you create this the neural network like you do here, you call neural network constructor. And then you call the superclass, the NN module init function. And then you have some, your own functions like a flatten layer. And then you have this sequential layer with a linear followed by relu, linear, relu, linear, relu. And here is also another difference from uh, TensorFlow. You have to give the numbers here, the sizes of the nets. Because in uh, TensorFlow, they calculate those themselves. But here you have to give the numbers. But if you give the wrong numbers, it at least complain. And here is the forward session that is when you are using your network just for inference. That is, you have a sign here, what kind of sign is it? Then you have this forward thing. So here you create your neural network and you move it to this device, which can be the CUDA device or the CPU device. So now you have your model in the CUDA device because it's using CUDA device and you copy it to the device. And this takes a little bit time, maybe not for a model, but for a lot of data. So you can print this model and you give an explanation about how it looks like. So this flatten means if you have a 28 times 28 a picture, you flatten it, that means you put it just in a line, linear, and then you end up in 784 pixels in a line. And then you have just linear layers. So this is not the CNN layer, as Songwa mentioned, this is a fully connected network, and that is not a good, good way of, to solve those things. Anyhow, and then we need to have some kind of loss function and optimizer. We will see a little bit more about this in, in the next few minutes. And uh, cross entropy loss means that you combine and when you use classifiers and so on, usually you see, yeah, this is traffic sign of class five, but you, the model think is class seven or nine or something you don't measure the difference between these class numbers. So you just count number of wrong classes. So if you want to have some kind of a function which you want to approximate, then you maybe have a root mean square loss function instead. And then the optimizer, Songa mentioned a bit about optimizer previously. So we have this, this statistical gradient descent, or stochastic, I mean, gradient descent. And there are other models like Adam and so on, which might be better. So we haven't run this, yeah. There's too many cats now. And then when we train this network, we can define a function now how to train this. So we have a data loader and we go through all these examples. And then we move this example to the device. And this is a batch. So this is 64 at the time. And then you send in this X values to the model. And then you get a prediction of 64 numbers. And then you use your loss function to see how bad is this prediction so you compare what the model predicted with the desired result, which you have in your training examples. So you calculate the loss with this loss function, in this case, cross entropy. And 
then there are these three magical lines, which are almost always in uh, PyTorch. So first you set those gradients to zero because they otherwise have the previous value. And then you propagate this loss backward. We'll see that in a short while. So the loss calculated here is used to modify the parameters in the network. And then you use this optimizer, this SGD, to take a new step, to try a new, new place to evaluate the model and so on. And this can be more or less smart, depending on what, if you have SGD or Adam or some other function. And here we see if the batch now, yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No problem. The optimizer, um, when it calculates loss, backward is calculating the- uh... Loss backward, or, or this is calculating the loss. Yeah. And this propagates the loss backwards through the net by using- the gradients are getting- Derivatives, the... yeah. There, right, in, in the backward. So how optimizer knows what happened in the gradient? Because optimizer doesn't have any connection somewhere. It didn't even sit anywhere. Uh, it's connected to model parameters here. So they have, the optimizer have a connection. To because the, the gradient the finds the weights, right? Uh, the loss is a number like 17 or something. Yeah. And then this backward calculates, oh, with an error of 17, how much should we propagate backwards to, mm -hmm. to these different uh, yeah, the layers, all the weights and biases. It can become clear a little bit in this okay. example, next example, but uh, yeah. And then the optimizer uses a step, for instance, here, if you have an error and a loss, you can't use everything. So you multiply the updates of the weights by a factor, a learning rate, in this case, 0 0.001, the learning rate. I think from a software perspective, at least yeah. looking at the three lines of code, I don't see a link between optimizer and loss in the data structure. Yeah, that, that was my question. Yeah, yeah, because there are different objects here. But the optimizer have connection to the model, at least. So it reach the model parameters which is what it changes, the weights. But loss doesn't have it. No, the loss, exactly. The loss only see what the model predicted and then compare the difference between what it should be. Actual, yeah. So it, this doesn't know much about how the networks and so on. So that's the good and bad thing about PyTorch. You can easily write your own loss function and use it instead. So it's not not very advanced to do. You don't know to know need to know the details of uh, PyTorch and so on. So you just get two values and you calculate the loss between them. So for traffic science you can just see if all of them are equal or count the number of difference. Predicted five, it should be seven, that's one wrong and so on. So it's a kind of beauty of PyTorch that you can write your own PyTorch or, or ordinary Python function and use for this. So this is not possible in, uh, not in an easy way in TensorFlow, for instance. So if we run this, it doesn't happen, it's only a definition. And then we have a, this step, uh, it, and backward, it calculates the derivatives, as I mentioned, of the net. So the inverse derivative of this ReLU, for instance, the partial derivatives, how the weights come in. But if you test, test it, you don't need to calculate any gradients which this does. So when you test it, 
you load it test data set and then you have this torch no grad which means you disable this gradient calculation because you are not going to update the net or doing some backward optimization step you only use the net as is to evaluate how good or bad it is so you just calculate your own loss here so use your loss function for each item and then you calculate how many are correct so you don't use this backward or optimizer step you just use your data run it through your model to see if it's okay then you add one otherwise you add zero so basically we just like uh, run the forward uh, pass yeah so we only run this this one so that means this is much quicker you don't have to calculate a lot of derivatives and so on so you save some time and memory and so on so you can run this in a mobile phone or very small uh, there's I, I have one question here. um i see now that in this test function the forward is not like uh, explicitly invoked so i guess uh, pytorch uh, did that in the background for us the forward yeah i mean in the network there's the forward uh, function that was declared yeah this loss function i mean the forward if you go up to the network again the forward uh, yeah yeah the forward here yeah uh, yes so i see it's not uh, called explicitly in the code down during the test yeah no, that's so right guess... yeah yeah so so it's just using model x yes uh, okay so i guess it can read that you're not using gradients, then you don't, then you should use the forward. Okay, okay, I suspect Otherwise so. Otherwise, so. like here, when you call model, you don't have no grad. Mm. So then you use the, but maybe, I don't know, the init is only run once. So I guess it's also using the forward. Yeah, I think I, I read uh, somehow that that is how yeah. it goes. Like so this is run... only run once when you create this network here. So this init function is only run when you create a new network. And it's, the model stuff is running the forward. But it's mentioned also that you shouldn't run forward yourself directly because there is some other stuff going on behind the scenes as well. So this model call are doing more things than just like, exactly. forward. So, yeah. Mm, thank you. So if we run the tests and the definition, and now we can run, we can run with a fewer epochs, maybe just two. So we see here, the epoch one and uh, So you see the, the run the training and then it runs the test. And then you run another epoch. And so the accuracy is the same and the, this is the same. A little bit better. <laughs> so it didn't learn so much in this case. And the accuracy is quite bad. I don't know if there's some problem with data, I forgot to download or whatever happened. So we can also run from start. If I forgot something, run all to see if it works better. But it seems it's run for only two hepocoxes. So maybe it needed more. Yeah, so it was. But you see now it's getting better. <laughs> and here's also getting a little bit better. And so on. So yeah, of course, I didn't want to waste your time with many epochs. So you can try for yourself with many epochs. And then I think we go to the next about tensors and they are very close to NumPy arrays. And these are much more effective than uh, Python arrays. And they are called tensor, towards tensor. Usually tensor is when you have an uh, matrix which is more dimensions than two but this can be two as well so that's okay 
So you can read with this, you can start with random or ones or zeros. And there are like, I think it was about 100 functions you can do. So there's a lot of uh, functions you can numerical things to do with tensors, random numbers, different distributions and so on. So it's very powerful. Yep, so I lost here. So this was tensors. You can read it quickly through yourself. I will give you this link as well if you don't find it yourself. And then we have these data sets and loaders. We have tried it a little bit with this training data and how to fetch it. And here we have labels manually and print, print and plot those things. So I'm going to jump forward to transforms. You can also use transform and then you have a function called a lambda function. That is you describe a function just in a single line. So you don't need to make a definition. Sometimes it's useful to have this lambda function where you have a variable y and then you just run this torch tensor y and do some scatter and zeros and so on. So you define a function when you call this target transform. So here you can make things like rescaling pictures and so on. So you can read this, but then I'll go to this build a model and autograd where we can see this definitions of derivatives and so on. So we get this device, we'll try that. We define the class, we inherit from N and module. We have the model and so on. And here we also can call layers directly softmax <clears throat> and see how this works. And you can put print statements there to see how it works. Yeah. So yeah, you can read it, it's not so difficult. But then I go to autograd, which is this automatic differentiation. And this is the, the important thing in PyTorch and also in uh, TensorFlow, of course, that we use back propagation to propagate the error back to the weights. So we have some errors from this loss function. And then is the question is how should we change the parameters based on that? So we have this differentiation engine autograd. So it automatically computes gradients for any graph. So it's very powerful or useful at least. So suppose we have a, a layer here with X with just ones, five ones. And then we have Y, which is expected output, maybe it's three zeros. And then we have the weights W and B, the weights and the biases with just random numbers. We start our network with random numbers. And then we say this requires gradients is true. This means PyTorch keep tracks of these weights and B that the gradients should be calculated backwards. The, the partial derivatives, if you call them so. So we calculate set by matrix multiplication of X times W and then we add B and then the result will be Z. Then we use cross entropy with this set and Y, what, what, it, what it should be. And then we calculate the loss. So this kind of graphs is called computational graphs. Of well, course, this is a very simple network with only one, one neuron, so to say. But this can be very complicated and it's very complicated to calculate all the derivatives in all the nodes and so on. But this is- Just a, just a question. Uh, why do we need a gradient for the bias B? If we are going to update. So if we get some kind of loss, yeah. then we need to modify both W and B, how we should improve those values to get a less loss next time. Okay, okay, got it, thanks. 
So of course, we, if we don't want to change B, oh, we want zero B or random numbers, then we just press false here instead or not writing anything. Then the B will not be updated. So we will keep the B values at these random numbers or maybe we want one or zero or something. And that's the beautiful of this net because if we have many layers, we can, for instance, freeze a layer. Oh, we don't want to update B. We are happy with these B values. Maybe just use the W. Then we just remove this, this parameter. So, Carla, if you want to uh, do transfer learning and only uh, uh, you want to freeze all the convolutional layers and only train the fully connected layer. So yeah. how do you uh, freeze uh, part of the W? Uh, you can't freeze part, as far as I know, you can freeze part of the W, but if you have many layers, you can freeze the Ws in a certain layer, of course, or you can freeze a layer. So that's when you use transfer learning, you have a, this is just one, <laughs> one layer, but you have many layers, then you can remove this for a particular like layer three or so, or the last layers or every layer except for the last layer, which you use in transfer learning. So you can- well, In transfer learning, we <laughs> import the weights and create a new model out of it, right? Uh, sorry, no, I lost the-, the I mean, I didn't do it in, in PyTorch, in, in Keras I did, in TensorFlow Keras. Yeah. I just had to import the weights and uh, create a model out of it. And the internal of the model, of course, was also provided by the library. Like yeah, the so there's a freeze function in uh, TensorFlow, how to do that. I, I did it, I, I forgot it exactly how now, but it's absolutely possible. But the, the advantage with PyTorch is here you can freeze just a B or just a W or some other stuff. So this is very useful if you have a non-traditional network, for instance, in deep reinforcement learning, we don't use CNNs and so on. Then we can freeze or modify just part of the network, which we find useful. So it's more flexible, but a bit more difficult to run. <clears throat> so then we can compute the gradients with this loss backward function. So we have this that the loss divided <laughs> partial derived, derived by W and by B. So you can compute these gradients. So we, we can run this code but as I mentioned, you can also select Torch no grad. Either you call Torch no grad or you use this with statement. That means within this scope, there's no gradients. So when you do this matmul, it runs faster than this matmul. Uh, you can also use detach. Uh, so this is if you want frozen parameters, like fine tuning a pre-trained network, like in transfer learning. And you also speed up the computations when you are only doing forward paths. If you're going to just de detect the traffic signs, you don't need to calculate all these derivatives because you're not going to use them. You're not going to train the network. You just use the network. I have a question, Kali. Yes. Uh, in which other scenario would we want to do uh, like uh, no grad apart from uh, during inferencing? Yeah, if you use Lenet or something, as Songa mentioned, then you just want to adapt the last layers, the classification. You know, this Lenet or, or other ResNet or other stuff, they are like 100 layers and so on. So for training those 100 layers, you need a very, very powerful computer and a lot of time. But if you want to use the main things those very advanced nets learn, like recognizing if it's a triangle, if it's certain colors or patterns or something in the picture, and then you use 
just these high level features to classify those into different traffic signs or different diseases on the skin or, or different species of dogs and cats and so on. So then you can freeze the, the just the first 100 layers and then you just retrain the last two layers or so. And then it runs much more quicker and you can run it on your CPU maybe. Otherwise you need a very, very powerful a computer to retrain like 100 layers instead of just two, the last two. Mm. Yeah, so that's thank very, you. very useful. And it's possible, as mentioned, to do in TensorFlow as well, but here it's a little bit more flexible. So yeah, if you run this in Coolab, we can just remember to, yeah, sorry for the Swedish. Now too many sessions. <laughs> Sign, uh, connect, initiate. So, so if you import torch, so we have these different tensors. And we have this loss function, and we can print the gradient function is this and that for the loss, and we can use this loss backward. And then you can see the gradients for W and B. So this is the derivatives given, given this calculations. So this X, Y, uh, W, these tensors are by default in CPU, right? Because you didn't move it. Yeah, exactly. They're not moving down here. So we're just using the CPU. That's right. Yeah. So, but it's a small function, does it? When you have very small models, it's faster to run on CPU because the copying takes time. So sometimes when you work with deep reinforcement learning, it's maybe faster to run on CPU than the GPU because the copying is too slow. So we see here is how to calculate the gradients based on the W and the B. The B is only three and the W is five times three. And then we can, uh, See that requires grad, true, but no grad, then it's false. So, so this finishes my uh, short introduction to Coolab and uh, PyTorch. I hope it was useful. And I think maybe we should have a five minutes break before Songwa continues. Sorry for taking eight minutes of your time, Songwa. Yeah, that, let's take a break. Yeah, so Songwa had a nice V clock, was it like this? Set alarm. Uh, no. uh, you should uh, pick a timer uh, on the right. Yeah. Timer, yeah, this will be fine, 4.47. It was mind reading my five minutes. <laughs> So see you in uh, five minutes then.
So let's uh, continue on the lecture. We are, we were discussing We were discussing CNN case studies. So the first one is uh, Lynette uh, 5. It's called Lynette 5 because it has five uh, layers. Uh, so that's uh, not counting the pooling layers because pooling layers do not have any parameters. So typically when we count layers, we only count the uh, weight layers. That's the w layers with uh, weights and biases. So uh, yeah, you can uh, work out the uh, equations for deriving uh, the input output uh, sizes. So AlexNet in 2012, uh, is the uh, network that uh, had a tremendous uh, performance improvement on ImageNet. And this is the uh, work uh, that triggered the deep learning revolution. Before that, people were not believing in deep learning, but after this net, AlexNet, uh, the whole thing got started. Uh, so uh, yeah, here's the uh, overall uh, architecture. And VGGNet, <coughs> VGGNet in 2014 has this architecture. So gradually you reduce the uh, spatial size and increase the uh, number of channels or depths. So, and, and also, uh, Notice that <clears throat> notice that the uh, the uh, size uh, in the convolution layers uh, always stay the same. So one twelve through the uh, two conv layers, all one one twelve times one twelve, and uh, fifty six times fifty six, and twenty eight times twenty eight. So you only reduce the uh, the spatial size by pooling, not by conf layer. So that's a pretty common pattern in deep learning in CN design. So uh, that's called the same padding we mentioned before. So uh, if you if you had so uh, same padding is when, when, when you have uh, P padding equals half of F minus one, then the output has the same size as the input. So otherwise, if you have no padding, then the output is smaller than the input. So in VGGNet, it used the same padding in all the conf layers. So as a result, all the conf layers preserve the uh, uh, preserve the spatial size. I think I should emphasize that same padding. That's not a rule, that's a kind of a good practice, a kind of a rule of thumb. <clears throat> so here are the details. You should be able to do the arithmetic uh, for calculating the uh, uh, size of each layer. So the, uh, the three by three count layers can be stacked uh, to uh, increase the receptive field size. So in this case, uh, suppose you have 
two three by three uh, filters stacked together, uh, then the receptive field is five by five, the same as one five by five filter, but the number of parameters is reduced. And also the number of uh, nonlinear activation functions, in this case, uh, ReLU, uh, is re increased from one layer uh, to uh, two uh, layers. So uh, this also increases model capacity. So decrease the number of parameters and re increase the model capacity uh, with a stacked uh, three by three comp layers. It's also a very common pattern. So this is the VG, VGG net uh, summary. So memory is the memory size of activation maps, the feature maps. And weights are the number, number of uh, weights, number of uh, uh, filter weights. So the number of bi the biases are omitted in the calculation for simplicity. So VGG 16 with 16 weight layers is the best performing uh, variant among the, uh, all these variants. So, uh, uh, and then this uh, Google net in 2014 uh, looks like this. So it has the inception layer inception module uh, stacked together. So, so the name uh, Google net, notice it's a capital L, so it uh, pays tribute to the net. Uh, and, and also the, the name inception module came from this meme. So this is the movie uh, Inception uh, about the dreams nested in dreams. So this, this uh, you're going uh, deeper and deeper into the dreams. So uh, this uh, inception module uh, means that you're going very deep with the inception module stacked together. So, uh, so also they have the additional classification heads. So typically you have one classification head at the uh, very uh, end of the uh, CNN uh, with softmax, but they, they added additional softmax heads in the middle. So uh, it forces the network to learn uh, meaningful features even in the middle early layers. So typically uh, you have simple primitive features like edges and corners at the early layers and more semantically meaningful, more sophisticated features at the later layers. But by adding this additional classification head, you're forcing the earlier layers to learn also uh, more semantically meaningful, higher, more abstract features. So uh, this uh, is a form of regularization. That is, it's uh, giving the network more constraints uh, to, uh, as it learns. So t sometimes it's a good idea, sometimes it's not. Uh, so uh, if you have too much regularization, maybe it affects your final classi classification accuracy because you only care about this last classification head. That's the only thing that matters. These two are just uh, for uh, regularization and for helping the training process. The output from these two classification heads are not uh, useful in the end. Uh, one question there. Hmm? These additional classification heads, do they also like, um, uh, are they also used in the back propagation or it's only the last one that is used during training? Uh, they, they are also back propagating. That's the whole point. So uh, every time you do forward propagation, you have uh, three places to back propagate. This guy back propagates all the way to the end. 
this guy back propagates uh, to here. Now this guy back propagates to here. So there are three sources sources for learning signal. Hmm. Yeah. So by adding these two classification heads, you're forcing the uh, the network to learn more abstract features at the early layers, and uh, that has the effect of uh, giving the network more constraints. So this inception module, uh, the, the whole idea is to, uh, uh, so if you cannot make up your mind about the future size, uh, one, one by one, three by three, five by five, uh, then have them all, have them in parallel. So this is one by one. Uh, this is uh, one by one followed uh, by uh, three by three. So the reason you have this additional one by one is to serve as a bottleneck to reduce number of parameters and computational load. So that, this refers to these two layers, these two one by ones. And uh, yeah, so uh, by having this uh, parallel uh, pass uh, through this uh, module, Essentially, you are uh, achieving the effect that you have uh, all the possible filter sizes in one module. And which one, whichever one is best, uh, you don't know. So uh, it depends uh, on the, uh, on the uh, task that you're training for. Sometimes maybe the three by three is the most effective. Sometimes maybe the five by five is the most effective. So, uh, so the channel concatenation uh, concatenates the outputs of the other four paths into one uh, single output. So, uh, so the number of channels is uh, 32 plus 32 plus 128 plus 64. So all the four uh, paths added together. So hopefully the network will learn uh, with the best match. Uh, so, uh, so, so that you know how to determine a pre, a pre, uh, beforehand, uh, which filter size to use. The training process automatically selects the best filter size, and the other filters maybe have very low weights and will not be effective. I'm just wondering. Uh, this inception model seems to have a lot of things going on. Is it? Um, considered state of the heart or like is it used in the industry uh, as it is? Oh yeah, uh, so inception, uh, this uh, Google net is a very widely used industry. Uh, it is the, at, at least in 2014, it was a state of the art. Uh, even today, I think it's widely used. So let's look at uh, the, uh, the bottleneck uh, layer. So why do you have the one by one uh, before the, uh, uh, the five by five or three by three? Uh, so, uh, so if you have a five by five filter applied to a 28 by 28 input image with depth 192, so uh, at, with the same padding of uh, two, so you maintain the apple size also at 28 by 28. Then number of parameters is, uh, this is uh, one filter and multiplied by 32, you get uh, uh, this many parameters. The number of multiplies is, so this is for one output and this is number of outputs. And if you have the bottleneck layer one by one before five by five, you reduce the first reduced number of channels from 192 to uh, 16. And then you, uh, you, you apply the 32 
uh, five by five filters to get uh, the uh, channel uh, 32 channels. So because this uh, one by one uh, filter reduced the number of channels by a lot from 192 to 16, the subsequent uh, operation by the five by five filter uh, now has a lot uh, less uh, operation and a, a lot less parameters. So look at the number of parameters. For the one by one conf, you have each filter has 192 parameters. There are 16 of them. And the, uh, the next conf layer, each filter has five by five by 16 parameters and there are 32 of them. So add it together, that's only 15,000 compared to uh, 150,000. And number of multiplications, so that's uh, for one output, uh, this is for one output and uh, you have 28 by 20, uh, no, so uh, this is for one uh, filter application and then this is the number of uh, output elements. And similarly for the, uh, for the next layer. So the computation is reduced also by 90%. So this is, this is the reason why they put this uh, one by one conf uh, in front of the three by three or five by five. It's to reduce the, uh, the computation load and to, to reduce number of parameters. Okay, any questions uh, on, on this? So it's called adding a bottleneck. So this is the Google Net size uh, compared to AlexNet. Uh, they have uh, 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 12 times less parameters. Uh, due to no uh, fully connected layers and two times more compute due to uh, more conf layers. So, uh, so if you look at the overall architecture, uh, I think they uh, replaced, uh, yeah, softmax is there. So the softmax, uh, it's fully connected, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, except that, everything else is convolutional. So, but in uh, AlexNet, uh, there are uh, two, I think uh, two or three, uh, fully connected layers before the softmax. Yeah, that's uh, uh, three fully connected layers. And they contribute a, a lot of parameters, over 90% of the uh, total number of parameters in the net. So by getting rid of uh, these uh, three fully connected layers, uh, Google Net uh, has a lot of fewer parameters. So uh, exception uh, and mobile nets, uh, their major innovation is to introduce the depth-wise separable convolution. So uh, this on the left is the regular convolution. So this is uh, a uh, three-channel input uh, and four filters. Each filter has the same depth, uh, same number of channels as the input. And uh, each filter generates one uh, output, uh, output channel. So four filters give you four output channels. So a depth-wise separable convolution, it, first it, it, uh, the filters, each filter has only one channel and you convolve the filter with uh, one channel of the input. So this violates the uh, previous uh, equation we saw before. Uh, and we saw that there's this rule that the filter must have 
the same uh, depth, the same number of channels as the input. But here, the, that rule is violated. So, and then for the blue channel, you apply this uh, one filter and get this one map, yellow channel and orange channel. So you have three uh, output activation maps, and then you apply one by one. One by one convolution is, is also called pointwise convolution. So uh, now this is a regular normal convolution. Uh, it has uh, three channels applied to the uh, input of three channels. You get a single output for each one by one filter. So that's four filters with four output channels. So it's called a depth-wise depth separable convolution uh, because the intermediate uh, feature maps, these serve as bottleneck to reduce number of parameters and computational load. So let's uh, do the math uh, for regular convolution. You have, uh, say, uh, two input channels and the four filters number of parameters. So uh, one filter is uh, this many parameters and uh, four filters, that's 72 number. Uh, I think I forgot the, uh, the bias, it's only the weights. <laughs> number multiplies is uh, this many. So, uh, so look at the uh, depth wise convolution followed by a point-wise convolution. So uh, depth-wise convolution first uh, convolves uh, this input channel with this filter to generate this one output channel and this input with this filter to generate uh, this one output channel. So uh, and followed by point-wise convolution. So you're applying the first filter So it's essentially uh, uh, performing a mixing of the two channels, weighted mixing. So to generate uh, one uh, output uh, channel with the same size as the input. And similarly for the other three uh, filters. So the number of uh, parameters uh, for uh, this, so the first uh, depth-wise convolution, you have a three by three for each filter, you have two filters. Uh, I think this is the bias. This one, here added the, added the bias, I should unify. Uh, yeah, I should add the bias to the previous slide. Uh, so number of multiplies is, so this is uh, for one uh, filter and you have two filters. So uh, three by three by one by two is the uh, number of multiplies required to uh, generate one output elements. Uh, then you have uh, 16 output elements in each channel. And then the, for the pointwise convolution, you have uh, number of multiplies and, and number of uh, outputs. So total of four, 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 416 uh, multiplies. So multiplication is the most expensive operation. Uh, in uh, CNN's uh, computation. Addition is not that expensive. So we only count multiplies when we uh, uh, calculate the uh, computational cost. So, uh, so if you uh, compare uh, these two number of parameters 
goes from 72 to uh, 26. Number of multiplies goes down from 1,000 uh, to 400. So uh, the, uh, the main reason for the reduction is this stepwise uh, convolution operation. So for regular convolution, you are performing the, uh, the multiply, uh, uh, the convolution operation across all the channels of the input to generate one output element. Whereas for depthwise convolution, you are uh, performing a uh, convolution on a single channel of the input and generating the output. So this particular change uh, drastically reduces the number of operations and number of parameters. So you can, you can do the uh, calculation yourself to convince yourself. <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, these two nets, uh, exception and mobile nets are designed to be uh, efficient uh, in inference. So uh, they are designed uh, for mobile, mobile phones or other uh, small devices. So their first uh, most important emphasis is efficiency. So they introduced this depth-wise convolution just to increase efficiency. And of course, uh, this is different. This is not regular convolution and they're not equivalent computationally in the result. So, uh, but if you train the network, uh, with uh, these uh, fewer parameters, uh, you may get uh, a worse performance if you have a large amount of data, uh, say for ImageNet with this depth-wise separable convolution. But that's okay because you gotta sacrifice something, right? You gotta sacrifice a little bit of accuracy for higher efficiency. So a ResNet residual networks, all right, if you want to uh, learn more about uh, this uh, depth-wise uh, separable convolution, so this uh, YouTube video is, is very good. So um, yeah, I, I use this Opera browser and cannot display the ads properly. I have to wait for it to finish. <laughs> so. So they, it, it derives the general formula uh, for, uh, for the two, uh, for the standard and for that's why separable convolutions and shows you the ratio of uh, number of multiplies uh, and also number of parameters. So if you wanna learn more. <clears throat> So a re residual networks is a very well known and very widely used uh, network. So uh, this is based on VGG uh, 19, 19 layer VGG, uh, adding more layers and scape connections. So the main innovation here is this escape connection. So typically this is the plane uh, net uh, typo here, plane. Uh, so uh, weight layer, relu, weight layer, relu. And then the re residual net adds, adds this additional uh, identity connection so that the output now is the FX, the, uh, the weight layer and relu uh, operations plus this X going through, uh, cutting uh, kind of a shortcut uh, going to the, uh, this particular point. <laughs> so, uh, so the skip connection has this form uh, hx equals fx plus x at, at these junction points. So you have many such skip, skip connections. So the benefits uh, are that uh, residual connections 
uh, help in handling the vanishing gradient problem in, in very deep neural nets. So a vanishing gradient is when you have so many layers in ResNet is uh, over a hundred layers. And, and uh, if you don't have the skip connection, uh, then uh, the gradients when you back propagate, they may have a very strong uh, gradient signal at the later layers close to the output, but gradually close uh, as you go through the layers to, uh, towards the input, the gradients are, uh, are uh, uh, trending towards a zero, they're vanishing. Uh, so by adding escape connections, uh, you can uh, avoid that problem. So, so the skip connection, if a identity mapping is close to optimal, then weights can be small to capture minor differences only. So in other words, a useless layers can learn to be identity mapping. This allows stacking many layers, uh, for example, 152 layers without overfitting. So that is, that is uh, the, uh, the uh, skip, uh, uh, this uh, identity mapping connections uh, allows the network to uh, behave like a shallower network if necessary, or behave like a deeper network uh, when, if necessary depending on your, uh, your uh, data size, your task, uh, specific task, it's very flexible. So suppose some layers are, are not, turns out to be not useful uh, during the training, then it'll just simply uh, learn to uh, skip it. If some layers are important, then it will learn not to skip the layers. So uh, it all depends on the training, it's not manually controlled. So this allows it to uh, look like 152 layers, a tremendously deep network. Uh, you are likely to have overfitting, but having the skip connections allows you to uh, have a, in fact, in fact, a shallower network than it appears. So another perspective is the ensemble perspective. Uh, so uh, consider this uh, standard neural net with uh, three layers. You have a nested function. And then if you have a rest net, you have uh, x1 equals f1, x0 plus x0, x2 equals uh, this. And if you plug in, you have uh, this. Now, f3 is uh, a function of x2. If, if you plug in, you have uh, this expression. So uh, suppose uh, F2 uh, is a vector of very small uh, values, then it looks like the input X0 bypassed the second layer completely on its way to the output. So, uh, yeah, suppose F2 is uh, close to zero, so essentially it uh, blocked the uh, data, in, in, it blocked the data flow uh, at this point. So uh, uh, then the data flows only through uh, these paths. So only through the escape connections uh, that skipped the F2 uh, layer. So uh, therefore uh, every input to the ResNet may activate a unique pass to the output. And total number of such paths, possible paths is two to the nth power, where n is total number of layers in the network. Since every layer may be either on or off for a given input. So compare this with a standard network where there's only one single pass for any input corresponding to all layers being on and no layer is skipped. So by on, uh, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the uh, layer is not skipped. By off, I mean the, uh, the layer has such small uh, output that it, it essentially uh, skipped. 
so uh, the consequence is that it's resilient to layer deletion. So after you train a ResNet, if you delete a few layers, it doesn't really matter. It's very adaptive and also shortening of effective paths. So for a uh, 152, 152 layer ResNet, uh, most paths are only 20 to 30 levels deep because uh, majority of the layers are skipped. So does the skip connection create exploding gradient problem? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, I mean, uh, suppose you skip 100, over 100 layers. So, uh, so look at this case. Suppose you, you, you only uh, uh, 20 to 30 layers are not skipped. Then it's just like a 20 to 30 layer regular CNN, right? Yeah. So it's completely normal CNN with 20 layers. Yeah, uh, one more question. In none of the CNN architecture I, I have seen so far has any dropout layers in, in, in middle because uh, exploding gradient never occurs there or it's just uh, a common practice. Well, a dropout is a common practice for regularization. Uh, yeah. And it's orthogonal to uh, all the uh, uh, architectures I introduced here. Uh, so for any of the network, uh, even starting from Lynette, you can add dropout. Uh, maybe not necessary because Lynette is so small, but uh, from AlexNet, you can add dropout. So it's an orthogonal issue. I did not discuss it here. Oh, okay, oh, so yeah. that means it's already there. But, okay. Yeah, in practice, it should be always there. Yeah, okay. thank you. So this is the uh, ImageNet uh, competition. Uh, uh, ImageNet is called uh, Large Scale Image Recognition Competition, uh, IRS VRC. It's just ImageNet, I forgot the acronym. So the, uh, the, uh, you can see that with increasing number of uh, layers, uh, the, uh, the error rate is decreasing uh, year by year. And the, the uh, depth is increasing tremendously from AlexNet eight layers to VGG 19 layers, ResNet 152 layers. And for, for CIFAR 10, you can see that for, for plain nets, that is a regular CNN without skip connections with, uh, so the solid lines are the test errors. The uh, dashed lines are the training errors. And this is for uh, the CIFAR 10 uh, with ResNet. So as you can see, the uh, ordering is, uh, so ordering uh, for the test errors, we, which we care about uh, the most. So having more layers uh, essentially introduced overfitting here. That is the test error is very high uh, for more layers with additional layers, but for ResNet, you don't have overfitting. The test error continues to reduce, even uh, with the increasing number of layers, uh, thanks to the uh, to the uh, skip, skip connections. So uh, for for ResNet uh, training, uh, they use the stochastic depths. That is for each mini batch of inputs, randomly skip some layers. That is uh, to replace them with a identity mapping, essentially uh, cut off uh, certain layers. So for mini batch one, maybe you cut off uh, these two layers. For mini batch two, you cut off these three layers and so on. So it's random. Uh, so by doing this during training, 
uh, you are reducing the network depth during training uh, to, uh, to force the network uh, to learn uh, more efficiently uh, with, the, uh, with the skip connections. And during inference, you always have the full depth. That is, uh, all the connections are always there. It may learn to uh, skip some connections uh, by very small weights in the middle, uh, but uh, at least from the architecture perspective, uh, at, the, at inference time, all the layers are there. But at training time, you explicitly drop uh, some layers. So this is a little bit like a dropout, uh, except you are dropping uh, uh, entire uh, layers. So like 100% dropout for that layer. Right. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, the pr progress of uh, the uh, ImageNet competition. Uh, before 2011, before Ale AlexNet, these are the classic computer vision techniques with handcrafted filters, achieving a best performance of 25% uh, uh, error rate. And with AlexNet, it's reduced to 16%. That's a kind of a revolution. And gradually, with VGG, with GoogleNet, ResNet, it's reduced uh, more and more. So this is the human performance. So uh, this is uh, a, a guy, a researcher, who actually uh, looked at all the images, eyeballed all the images, and uh, performed the uh, prediction task by himself and uh, uh, recorded the error rate. He didn't do all the uh, a few million uh, pictures, of course, but just a sample of the uh, pictures. Uh, but still, it took him uh, quite, quite a few, uh, quite, quite, I think it's a few days or weeks. So he got 5.1% error rate. So you can see that the deep learning and that, especially the latest ones, uh, really outperforms humans. So CNN layer patterns. Uh, so a typical CNN architecture has the pattern of uh, input, a uh, conf, uh, relu, and uh, pooling, conf, relu, pooling, and so on. And finally, in the classification layer, uh, you have a, uh, you flatten the, uh, the last car layer output, uh, and then you, you have a few fully connected layers followed by the last softmax layer. So typically the, uh, the last, uh, so you may uh, stack multiple conf relu layers uh, before doing pooling. Uh, so uh, typically less equal to three conf relu before pooling. And the uh, last uh, uh, fully connecting layers is typically uh, less than three layers. So none of these are, are hard signs. I mean, they are most, uh, they're mostly uh, rules of thumb. So uh, some common architecture, you may have a very straightforward, a single a fully connected layer, a simple classifier, or a one layer, uh, or uh, the figure shows uh, this pattern, two conf relu pool and one FC relu and one FC, last softmax. And you may have conf relu, conf relu pool, so that's two conf relu layers before one pool, and you repeat it three times, and you have FC relu. So uh, this is generally a good idea for large and deep networks because multiple stacked conf layers can help, can help uh, more complex features of the input volume before the destructive pooling operation. So these are patterns are mainly for images, right? 
Uh, yeah, CNN is designed for image recognition. Uh, but it can also be applied for NLP for uh, oh. short sequences, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. As long as you can arrange the input in a, a two-dimensional grid, uh, so maybe with word embeddings, uh, you can uh, arrange the input to look like an image. Uh, yeah. Then you can apply CNN to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, do we have the similar uh, CNN patterns there too, or definitely changes? Uh, I think this is universal. Okay. Uh, so because uh, as long as you have this uh, input that uh, fits, that can uh, apply CNN tool, uh, then the rest is uh, is pretty generic. Uh, I mean, any good practice for CNN design uh, should be applicable across uh, different domains. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. And mostly it's at the end, it's softmax, means it's only for classification tasks then. Uh, yeah, softmax is a classifier. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's it, thank you. Uh, for regression, uh, then uh, you have uh, a regression head. So, uh, so uh, think of perhaps uh, for object object detection, you may have the loss function uh, of um, uh, I don't know y one, uh, y two, y three. Maybe you have three classes. Uh, cat, uh, dog, car. So that's a uh, soft max. Uh, then you have maybe uh, another uh, four parameters, A, B, C, D, uh, indicating the, uh, the position and size. So this is your picture, right? And suppose you have a cat in, in here. So that's a cat. You want to uh, produce a bounding box for the cat with uh, a center position, A, B, and its uh, width and height, C, D. So these four uh, parameters specify the uh, position and size of the bounding box. And these uh, three parameters specify the classification uh, result uh, for uh, this particular thing in the bounding box. So in this case, your loss will be a concatenation of the regression loss for the four real parameters uh, and uh, uh, the classification loss for the softmax. So that's an example of a combined regression and classification loss. So we'll have a lecture on uh, object detection uh, later. <laughs> So layer sizing, uh, so the input layer should be divisible by two many times. Uh, so typically 32, 64, uh, uh, 224. By that, I mean 224 by 224 uh, for ImageNet. Uh, so a comp layer should use small filters, uh, three by three at most seven, five by five, stride S1. Uh, input volume should have same padding uh, uh, as we saw for VGGNet, uh, comp layer does not uh, alter the uh, spatial size of the input uh, at, with this particular padding, which is uh, P equal one for three by three filter and P equal two for five by five filter. So the comp layers only transform the input volume depth wise uh, that is changing the number of channels, typically uh, increasing the number of channels as you go through the layers, but not perform downsampling. That's the job of the pooling layer for downsampling. So common settings are max pooling with two by two, uh, with strata of two, or you may have overlapping pooling with uh, uh, three by three uh, pooling and strata of two. So it's uncommon to see uh, receptive field sizes for max pooling that are larger than three, larger than three by three, 
because pooling is uh, lo too lossy. You're losing too much information. Uh, so, and, and then uh, in some cases, uh, because the amount of memory can build up very quickly. So uh, filtering uh, this 224 by 224 color image uh, with uh, three, three by three conf layers, 64 filters each, you have, uh, you create three activation uh, volumes with this size. So this is same padding, so the output has the same spatial size, 224 by 224 as the input. So, and then uh, this is pretty large in terms of number of pixels. Uh, so it occupies 72 megabytes of memory poor image for the three activation maps. So because GPUs are often bottlenecked by memory, uh, it may be necessary to compromise. Uh, and uh, in practice, you often make the compromise at only the first conf layer that's looking at the input image. For example, uh, AlexNet uses a filter size of 11 by 11 and strata four in the first conf layer. Uh, if you do that, uh, then uh, the, uh, the intermediate activation maps are smaller. Uh, so you're violating the, this rule. This rule is violated. So you're not using the same padding, uh, but uh, it's uh, necessary to reduce the, the uh, activation map size to reduce the memory size requirement. So these are all uh, uh, good practices, uh, rules uh, that uh, have been uh, summarized by researchers over the years uh, for achieving good performance. And memory size considerations uh, for the intermediate uh, volume sizes, the activation maps, uh, they uh, take a, a lot of memory. Uh, so most of the activations are on the earlier conf layers uh, and they need to be kept around for training because uh, you need to do back propagation. Uh, but if you're doing inference, uh, then you can only, uh, you can, you can uh, store only the current ac activations at the current layer and discard uh, the activations from previous layers. So if you have many layers, if you're doing training, then you have a round trip forward, uh, forward inference of back propagation. So you need to keep all the activation maps around uh, in the process. But if you have inference, you only have the forward inference part then you can compute uh, one layer and throw away the intermediate uh, activation maps as you go. So you can reduce the memory size consumption a lot if you're doing inference. So for the parameter sizes, that's the weights and biases and their gradients during back propagation. Uh, so uh, if you're using momentum, uh, which is a variant of uh, back, uh, gradient descent, then you need a step cache also. Uh, so, and then the, uh, the number memory to store the parameter vector alone should uh, be multiplied by a factor of uh, at least uh, three. That is the weights and biases uh, themselves plus the gradients plus the step cache. <laughs> so suppose every number needs a four bytes of storage for floating point uh, eight bytes for double, uh, one byte or smaller for optimized fixed point implementations. And then you can get a rough estimate of the memory size you need uh, for either training or inference. So transfer learning, uh, as we saw today, uh, so instead of training your CNN from scratch, uh, start from a pre-trained CNN, for example, ResNet, and fine tune it for your task. So uh, the e easiest way is to just replace the softmax classification head with your own and then retrain the network uh, by fine tuning the uh, softmax uh, layer. Uh, 
so so the first uh, this is necessary because you have a different task than ResNet. ResNet is designed for ABSNet recognition with a thousand categories, a thousand classes. But you may be doing a German traffic sign uh, classification. Uh, then you have uh, 30, 40 classes. So the head must be replaced. The softmax head should be replaced. And then you may, uh, you may freeze the com layer parameters and only train uh, the softmax layer, or you may freeze a part of the earlier conf layers uh, close to the input layer or none of the layers, uh, depending on uh, how different uh, your task is to that of the pre-trained CNN and how much training data you have. So the reason that you freeze the earlier layers is because early layers extract lower level features that are more likely to be common across the different tasks. No matter if you are doing German traffic sign or image net, uh, the earlier layers always extract the uh, corners, the edges, the very low level uh, features. It's the uh, upper layers that extract more semantically meaningful, more abstract features. Uh, so, so you always uh, freeze the early layers and up to the entire uh, all conf layers. Uh, uh, during a transfer learning. So if you have lots of data, then you can unfreeze. You can uh, train the, all the layers uh, starting from a, a pre-trained CNN. Uh, but if you have limited data, uh, then you may uh, uh, freeze uh, most of the layers to reduce the chance of overfitting. <laughs> So uh, that's the uh, uh, end of the uh, CNN uh, lecture. I have a short a few slides on recurrent neural nets. Uh, so I think I'll leave it to uh, uh, to a next uh, class. I can mention there was a question about using in industry. What kind of net? Oh, uh, so all of these nets I mentioned, uh, Lenet, uh, except that is too small, uh, VGG net, Google net, REST net, uh, they are all pretty good baselines if you do want to do transfer learning. Uh, yeah. I think REST net is perhaps more popular. Yeah, that's why I'm going to say that REST net seems to be the best trade-off with the speed and space and precision. So ResNet seems to be very popular, but the other ones are as well, as you say, just. Yeah, yeah and if you're doing uh, 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 the, uh, the, the mobile devices, embedded devices, then you can uh, look at the mobile nets. Mobile nets is really a family of uh, networks uh, that gives you a tuning norm for trading off uh, the complexity versus accuracy. Uh, yeah, so it's a very, uh, is, uh, so I think it's performance, uh, at least for mobile devices, is the best. So any other questions? So uh, in the next lecture, I will discuss uh, lecture 4.3, adversarial robustness, uh, because it helps you to finish the, uh, the first uh, lab. Uh, and then after that, I'll discuss lecture 4.2, object detection and segmentation. Uh, but of course, after finishing the last little piece on RNN first. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions on today's material? Okay, so I'll uh, see you on Monday. 
Yeah, a question to you, Songa. Sure. When I talked, I did record. Will it be on your account or my account? I don't know. <laughs> oh, how does that work? Uh... I'm not sure because I stopped the recording. So we'll see what happens. So when I leave, if there is some something showing up, I will put it in Umeplay. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. We'll see. And see if it will be two or one big one or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So. Hello. I have a question. Yeah. Um, will uh, details about these uh, famous networks um, uh, be included in the exam, in the written exam? Uh, yeah, all the lecture material is subject to an uh, exam. Uh, so, okay. for example, the depth wise separable convolution, I mm -hmm. may give you uh, uh, a configuration and let you calculate number of parameters, number of multiplies. That's one example question. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, stacked uh, three by three convolution layers introduced in VGG net, I may give you a question. Uh, so yeah, every net uh, introduces something novel. Uh, and uh, so these are all uh, knowledge points that you should, you should know, yeah. Okay, perfect, thanks. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, class dismissed. See you on Monday. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, thank you. Bye.